All right, so welcome everyone to the ECE, to Rutgers ECE Colloquium, and also at the same time to uh, the Shannon channel. So I'm, I'm really excited today to have Michael Gaspar from EPFL uh, to give a talk today on common information component analysis. So a pre brief introduction uh, to, uh, uh, to Michael. So Michael is a professor at, the, at EPFL in Switzerland. And before that, he's a professor at UC Berkeley. And he earned his, uh, his PhD from EPFL also in Switzerland. So Michael's uh, research interests are in general in network information theory and related coding and signal processing techniques with a focus on application to sensor networks and neuroscience. And also he's a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, he's a co-recipient of the 2013 Communication Society and Information Society Joint Paper Award. And he was an Information Theory Society Distinguished Lecturer and he won, he won many prestigious awards, including the ERC Starting Grant and the NSF Career Award. Michael, we're very ex excited to have you here. And the Zoom floor is yours now, if you want to start. Whoops, that was a nice feedback. Thanks very much, Salim, for the kind introduction and, and of course, for the invitation. Um, yeah, I have to say, actually, for these types of seminars, it's the very first one I'm giving. I've done, uh, you know, conferences, but not um, not this, so I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, at the same time, it's also the very first time that I'm talking, giving a long talk about this topic. So I'm sure there's plenty of stuff that's uh, not intelligible. And, and yeah, I should encourage you to interrupt me uh, with questions. I may not be able to monitor the chat. So if you have an urgent question, you can put it on the chat and then Salim can yeah, interrupt exactly. me. Or else you can just, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe wait until the end. So, or wait until the end, exactly. So, good. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a weird title, I guess. And so it's, it's all about kind of coming out of this uh, uh, canonical correlation analysis uh, uh, corner, which I'll explain to you what it is. And we'll go from there to common information. I'll try to explain to you this link. Uh, for you to decide how convincing it is, but then we'll have kind of one firm theorem, which is, I guess, the, the fourth section, which says that for Gaussian, we can actually prove something strong. All right, so what does it look like, right? The setup uh, is we have two data sets, the blue and the red one, um, uh, the X's and the Y's, and they are kind of you know aligned, if you wish, for every X sample, there is also a Y sample, and that is this numbering from one to little m, if you wish. Although we will not use this in, in, in the talk uh, for real, not in this talk. And I guess one question that you can ask yourself is you know, around feature extraction or dimensionality reduction or data visualization, which is, well, if capital N, the length of each of these samples, and I've made it the same here, but that is actually not essential. It could, the Ys could be longer or shorter than the Xs. It just makes the notation simpler. So let's take them to be of the same length, but let's suppose that capital N is quite large. So it will be a little hard to understand what's going on in this data. And then this natural question of uh, dimensionality reduction is that you would, would like to reduce each sample to a very short description that's hopefully salient. Uh, for example, a one dimensional thing, right? So that's what I've drawn here, if you wish. The U, the little U's are these very, you know, compact descriptions of the X samples. And the V's are very compact descriptions of the Y samples. Uh, one dimensional, let's suppose, then you can plot it like this graph on the right hand side on this slide, where on the X axis, I have the U's and on the Y axis, I have the corresponding V. And so every cross corresponds to one of the samples. And then if you wish in this small, visualization, the idea would just be that from looking, from staring at this plot, you could infer something about what kind of data uh, you're looking at, right? So that's a, this, this very high level picture uh, to have in mind. Um, it's a natural question, right? And it, it's a very old one. Um, I guess what I found is these two uh, kind of origins, it may go back further. And, you know, some of you I know are interested in historical aspects of math, and I'll be curious to hear. Uh, but I guess here, there's one work going back to Camille Jordan in 1875, and then perhaps more in the language that we like, 
by Harold Hotel in, in uh, 1936 about how you would do this. And what they did is a, a technique called canonical correlation analysis, which looks as follows, right? We look at the correlation coefficient between two random variables. I've just written this generic formula for you here again, but of course you all know this. So subtracting out the means and normalizing by the variances. And then the idea behind the uh, Jordan and Hotelling is simply to project. So you take your, all your vectors, your long vectors, X and Y, and you project them, project the X vector into direction A1, and you project the Y vector into direction y, uh, B1. And, um, and now you pick, how do you pick A1 and B1? Well, the idea is you pick them such as to maximize the correlation between these two guys, okay? So that's a, a thing, and I'm sure that many of you have seen this, but I, I need some of it. So I, I want to go through it perhaps at slightly too much detail with uh, you know, advanced apologies. Um, the, the device to analyze this is not surprisingly the covariance matrix of the merged vector x, y. Here it is, right? So I've written it out in way too much detail for you here. That's I'm, I'm stacking x and y into one long vector. And uh, oh, apologies, this should be a capital N to be consistent with what I said before. But well, I think you get the picture here. So I've just got in this matrix all of the different uh, covariances. And of course, there's four portions to it. And that's the bottom description here. There's a portion Kx, which is the covariance matrix of x itself. And then there's Ky. Uh, and then there's Kxy, which is the covariance matrix between x and y. And CCA. Uh, lives and dies because you can, without loss of generality, rewrite this coherence matrix into, or we should say by linear invertible transforms. That's actually the important thing. By linear invertible transforms, you can rewrite this coherence matrix into this uh, very nice shape, right? Where you have these identity matrices here on the upper and lower, the, the along the blocks of the diagonal, if you wish. And off of the diagonal, you have two more diagonal matrices, which I'm calling here capital sigma. So the claim is that you can get these, these new coordinates, so to speak, x twiddle and y twiddle, uh, where x twiddle is just a times the old x and y twiddle is b times the, the old y, and these are invertible matrices. And you get to this very nice shape. Now, what's so nice about it? What do we like about it? Well, if you permute just a little bit the entries, right? I've done this here. so. You can see between these two forms, all I do is I permute rows and columns, and you can see it, it is essentially just a block diagonal matrix where you have these two by two blocks. So what this transformation does is it takes the original random vectors X and Y and it converts them into two new random vectors that are composed of, in the, of uncorrelated pairs, right? So specifically in the tilde land, X tilde and Y tilde first components are correlated with some correlation coefficient sigma one, but they are uncorrelated with everything else. And that's what, what's nice about it. And so then of course, maximizing the correlation now is very, very easy in this new, in these new coordinates, you'll just pick the largest of the sigmas, right? And that's gonna be your projection uh, that you wanna keep. That's gonna be the one that maximizes this problem by Jordan or Hotel in later on. And perhaps just very, very uh, briefly to see how you do this, right? You just, what you do is to find these matrices A and B, these remappings. Well, you just start by whitening X and Y, uh, meaning you divide by the square root of the spectrum uh, with the usual. So if there's zeros, you don't do anything there and so on. But I don't think we want to go there today. Uh, once you've whitened them, you get some kind of residual correlation between the whitened, so the x hat and the y hat, that's some matrix. And then all you do is you take a, an SVD of that matrix. And then you can see that the twiddled one, so the twiddle land, the one that we really like, is simply you know, multiplying the hats, the x hats, by the left and right uh, singular vectors, respectively. So that gives you this, this uh, covariance structure. Uh, not just this, and I'm sorry, I want to go quickly back here. What I should say is a very nice follow-up that's very natural in the land of uh, canonical correlations is that once you've got the most correlated one, right? You pick the one pair that's the higher, highest correlation, you can then go down and pick the next highest correlation by 
restricting the new projections to be orthogonal to the ones that you picked in the first step. And in this way, you can, you can build up uh, you know, to the extent you want at the resolution you like, you can build up these common parts, these, these most correlated aspects of, the ve of, of these vectors X and Y. And I guess we'll refer to this as the top K TCA components, right? Which now you just pick the first uh, you know, K left singular values and the first K right singular values and you project in the way that I show here on the slide. So these are, this will be the thing that you want, the object of desire. It, K could just be one, right? That was the picture that I had on the first slide, or it could be larger. All right. Michael, a quick question. Uh, Please. Yeah, maybe it's a dumb question, but is there a relationship to, to PCA? Yeah, if you wish, this is of course the same exact PCA concept, if you wish, it was the same as PCA, except PCA is about the single guy, right? And this is about, Two guys that need okay. to be correlated. So it's a, in a sense, it's um, extending PCA to two guys, but it's it's right, it's about finding the what's most correlated between the two guys. Okay. But it's definitely the same. Okay, let, let me put it this way: it's exactly the same logic as PCA. Yes. So that's that's definitely true. And I guess. That said, right, PCA is also credited actually to the same paper by, uh, or maybe maybe not the same one, but to Harold Hotelling, right? Is he's considered to be one? I guess there's multiple sources of, of PCA, but that's one that is uh, kind of you know. So and, and another question, uh, Michael, that I'm got, I got on the chat. So uh, the question is: Is there any relation to partial least regression? Uh, that I couldn't say because I don't know what partial least regression is, least or least regression or least. Least. So I, I don't know least. either, but maybe later on uh, at the end. So that would be exactly, that would be for the end because I'd first yeah. have to learn what it is. Um, sure. Thanks for the question. So what does, uh, what does CCA do, right? So CCA of course has a very similar acronym to PCA. So this already uh, kind of suggestive, but it means something different, right? It, it, it says, canonical correlation. So anyway, what, how does it perform? Well, on Gaussian data, it performs as you would think it does, but here we're gonna to try to foil it, right? And it's a, a cheapo example, reminiscent of the ones that you have done in your exams, you have asked or received in your exams, right? This binary model. So X1 and X2 are just binary. Uh, sorry, X is a, is a vector of two components, but each component is binary and Y is the same, right? And, and what you can see here is that the components X2 and Y2 are just independent of everything and Bernoulli one halves. And then the U's and the, the, the U and the V are correlated to each other, but marginally Bernoulli one half. And then of course, that's the exercise you did. Any pair of these four random variables that sit inside the vector X and Y is independent. So the coherence matrix of this is simply identity. So CCA doesn't do anything for, for this example, right? So in other words, it's a bit dissatisfying because there would be some correlation, there will be some dependence, let's say, between these two, but CCA fails to see it. Okay. You can do the same exact examples for PCA. Um, how can you do that? How can you fix it? Well, one fix, and that's not the one I want to go through, but I want to still mention it, is called maximal correlation. Also goes back to a long way, or Hirschfeld, Gebelein, uh, where you say, well, let's not just do projections. Let's do functions. Any function f, any function g, well, measurable, but we don't want to go there today either. So maximize over all possible functions f and g. And I should say this does fix my binary modulo example, but in general, there is no nice solution for these functions. Perhaps not surprisingly, uh, there's an algorithm that's somewhat interesting. It's called the ACE algorithm, alternating conditional expectation, but there's no closed form solution for this problem. And perhaps even more, and that's just a, a quick teaser for the very last part. What, if you, what about having more than two data sets, right? I started out with just the red and the blue data sets. Suppose you, you also have a yellow data set, right? X, Y, and Z. I can set up another nice uh, Bernoulli example in such a way that any pair of these three guys, so any pair X and Y, X and Z, Y and Z are actually independent, right? And so anything based off of pairwise metrics will give nothing. That's clear because it's just independent. It will not find anything. And I guess the, 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 what I'm trying to get at is that you know, there's not, it's not really easy to extend from this correlation. How do you extend correlation to modern pairs? 
right? I guess there are some ideas, but they're not uh, they're not going to fix what I want to do. So instead, what do I want to do is a kind of a weird, different perspective on CCA. Okay, so uh, you should shoot this down maybe at the end of the talk, but <laughs> let me try. So CCA can also be understood as you first extract a common thing, a common thread, a, a commonality between X and Y, right? And that's what I'm claiming. So I'm trying to explain this to you. So this is one way in which you can think of CCA. It first extracts a common thing, and that will be abstractly denoted for the rest of the talk by W, which is the projection of X into the best. So I, I'm using U here to denote the best direction, right? The most correlated one. And y into the direction v. So these are the winners of the CCA game. That's the first step. You first find this, and then you project your data set x and y onto this common thing w. What do I mean by that? In this case, it's a linear a linear uh, conditional expectation, if you wish, or the Wiener filter. or, or the, the, you know, the, the So you, you just do this uh, kind of linear least squares estimate of w given x. Right? And magically, lo and behold, what you find is if you do this on both of these components, W, you actually get twice the same thing. In the case of X, you get U transpose X, comma, U transpose X. And in the case of Y, also you get the same thing twice, namely what you want, right? So this is a way, seems like a bit of a roundabout way of understanding what CCA does, okay? Funny enough, and that's just a footnote, the same actually holds for max correlation. So in max correlation, so by, by the way, I should maybe say, if you want to prove this, it's just a bit of linear algebra. It's not, it, it's true only because U and V are the CCA achievers. Otherwise, of course, it's not true. Um, the same thing uh, turns out to, to be true for, for max correlation. You can now denote, you can say the common thing now is F star G star, okay? Right, that's the common thing. And then again, you project, this time it's really the conditional expectation, nothing linear, just the actual conditional expectation. And again, magically, it actually turns out to be the case that if you do these conditional expectations, you get twice the same, so to speak. It, it actually gives you F star for X and G star for Y. Um, again, to prove this last step, uh, I guess it, it follows from what's called Rainey's representation of max correlation. Uh, it's not hard, but I don't want to prove it here. All right. So this is what we want to work on. So I guess the proposal is in that case, if, if that's what it's doing, right, let's think a bit more fundamentally about what it means to extract a common thing between X and Y. So that brings me to my second topic, which is common information. All right. So, uh, and, and just to quickly motivate it with an example, let X and Y be these two random vectors. <laughs> the X has a U and in the first component, in the second component, just X2. And Y also has U and then Y2. And they're all independent, U, X2, and Y2. And in a sense, you know, you can say that anything that's common information, that calls itself common information should answer it's U, right? That's a, in a sense the idea. Now you can extend such an insight in many ways. In fact, one leads directly to mutual information. I'll let you figure this out. Another leads to Gotch Kerner. I'll also let you figure this out. What I want to do is this here. So generalizing this insight as saying, search for a W such that X and Y are conditionally independent, right? That's true about U. If, if conditioned on U, X and Y are independent. And such that W is very compact, right? Because conditioned on U comma X2 comma Y2, it's also true that X and Y are independent, but there's kind of fluff in there, unnecessary fluff. How should we measure compactness? What we'll do here, there's various ways again, and I challenge you to do other ones. We will do what Weiner proposed in 75, which is to measure compactness by the information, the mutual information between the pair X, Y, and this W that, you're, that you keep. Right, so that's what we say. You want to minimize the information that you keep about the pair x comma y, but you have to make sure that you're conditionally independent. So, given w, you must be conditionally independent. Um, so that's a, a, a slight. It's actually not such a nice optimization problem. The the objective function is convex, uh, but unfortunately, the set, the constraint set, is not. So it's not so easy to solve. It's known, for example, for a symmetric. Of our binary symmetric double source, that's just to say that X and Y here are um, Bernoulli one halves and uh, you know connected by a bit flipping channel. I've plotted for a year the flip probability. We won't need this. What we'll need is the thing at the bottom of the slide. 
the optimizing W in this case can be described as W is equal to, well, let's say X, if X is equal to Y, right? And it's something completely independent of everything else, just a Bernoulli one half if X is not equal to Y, right? That's what we're looking for. And maybe I should go to the previous slide. What you can see down here, that's what we do. We minimize over all possible Ws that can depend in arbitrary ways on X and Y, okay? So this turns out to be the solution, not easy to prove. And in fact, there's a very special choice of alpha that I'm not writing on the slide because it's a pretty ugly formula that ensures that you are conditionally independent. So proving that this is the correct answer is not easy, but we'll, we, we won't need this. We'll only need the fact that this is the optimizer. Uh, the other thing that we'll want, and that's coming back to CCA. Um, and maybe here I should quickly say for CCA, as I told you, there is this nice knob, right? You can say, I want one dimension. I want two dimensions. I want the three dimensional. You can choose how many important components you want. Uh, we want to bring in this knob. And the idea is to go with something that we'll refer to as relaxed Weiner's common information. And to motivate this is here is a silly example. Perhaps we have X and Y are now composed of three pieces, right? A U that's common to both. And then this VX, VY, which has some kind of correlation, for example, like the doubly symmetric binary source that we just brought up. And then X3 and Y3, which are just independent of everything else. Right, and so the knob that we'd like to have is that at the course level, it only tells you U because U is really kind of the most significant common information. And then as you refine further, you want to get also whatever more there is between VX and VY. And the definition that we use, I should say it's not unique. I should say, you know, I challenge you to investigate others. We, the one we pick is this one here, where we say we introduce this knob gamma which is that you don't have to be conditionally independent now, but your conditional mutual information cannot be too big, right? So conditional independence, if you stare at this formula at the bottom of the, the screen would be, if you pick a gamma equal to zero, then it, it, the conditional mutual information is zero, it means conditionally independent. If you lift, if you raise gamma a little bit, then you allow more and more distribution. So you can bring down the minimum if you wish. And uh, you can play with this knob, okay? And I guess I have a picture. It's not particularly insightful, so I'm debating what, how much to say about it. I guess uh, the idea here is on the x-axis, I have this gamma, this, this uh, relaxation parameter. And on the y-axis, it's just a value of the common information, so, so how much there is. Um, you can see that I have Weiner's common information as the highest intercept on the y-axis up here. And that's, of course, when gamma is equal to zero, because when gamma is equal to zero, we revert exactly to the original problem of Weiner's common information. And then otherwise, it should go down. You can show a few nice uh, lower bounds. Uh, but what you can also show is that here, for my example here, it's exactly just this straight line. And then it'll be some convex shape, I guess, bending upwards in that case, of course, um, uh, ending at you know, this Weiner's common information, the, the non-relaxed version. So the important takeaway point is, is not necessarily this figure, actually. It's really that we have this knob gamma by which you can kind of take more or less of the common information between the two guys. Then we have a whole bunch of properties. I don't want to go through them. Actually, I probably should not even show this horrible slide. Um, if not one property that I should point out, which is this red one in the middle, a tensorization property that we will need in just a minute, which says the following. If you look at the common information between strings of X's and a string of X's and a string of Y, right? So that's X to the N right here. And oops, and Y to the N. Um, how do I get back? Maybe how about this? And Y to the N. Then uh, here we go. There was a fun function. So the common information at resolution level gamma between these two strings can be written as in this tensorized way in a particular case, namely when these two strings, x to the n and y to the n are made up of independent pairs, right? So each pair for an, a particular i, of course, x, i, and y, i, they can be arbitrarily connected, but independent of everything else. And that's, of course, reminiscent of what we said at the very beginning, this, this coordinate transform, which gave you, in that case, uncorrelated pairs 
and in a sense, we'll, we'll connect the dots, but I think you can already see where this is going. So this is a, a tensorization property that you can prove. It's a little ugly uh, because of this minimum that you still have to execute. You have to spread this gamma budget, this, this, uh, this relaxation budget, uh, budget over all of these n pairs, uh, you know, giving in a sense more to those uh, that have really high correlation or dependence and less where the dependence is smaller. I won't talk about the other ones and instead say now, so what is our algorithm? I think it's what may be very clear, right? It's exactly along this line, the, the line of, of what I said is this interpretation of max correlation or CCA, which is right. You first find a common thing and then you project. Uh, so, well, strictly speaking, first you pick your resolution level in this problem. You have to first say, well, how many components do you want, so to speak? But in this case, it's just a real number. You pick your gamma. Uh, picking gamma small means you get finer resolution. So you get a lot of common information, really everything. And the larger you pick gamma, the more and more, more and more, the, the more coarse your your common information becomes. So large gamma corresponds to small k, small number of dimensions that you retain. Uh, and then the next step is just find this, you know, Weiner's common information. Uh, and the last step is projected. I think at the very bottom of the slide, I have exactly this conditional expectation projection. In the paper, I have even a third one, which I don't want to talk about here. But uh, another one that's also interesting is what I'll call this map projection, where you just the, 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 you know, the low dimensional version of X is nothing but the arc max of, you know, the conditional marginal, this, this P gamma of W given X uh, overall W. So that's, a, I guess, an, another way in which you can project. And, you know, in a sense, this is a design problem. You can come up with yet other ways, I, I'm sure. And uh, so this is the algorithm. So to back to the binary model example, right? We had this one here. I explained it in some detail, and uh, you you remember that uh, um, CCA does not do anything here, right? Because it's just identity covariance. CICA with gamma equals to zero does exactly what you would like, right? Which is reduce x to w and uh, reduce x to u, sorry, and y to v. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess it, maybe just quickly to see this, right? The first observation is, of course, if you do a modulo sum just locally of the vector x, then this irre irrelevant component x2 falls out and we're left with just u. And then a y, um, the same thing, right? The irrelevant uh, component y2 falls out, just left with v. That's what I see right here. And then all we have to do is find this Weiner's common information problem. Now, if we assume that U and V are this binary symmetric source, as we did, right, in, for our example, then of course we find, we know, we, well, we stated that the solution takes this shape. The W is just equal to U with this famous bit flip alpha that I haven't told you. If U is equal to V and otherwise an independent Bernoulli one half, if you do a simple calculation to find the conditional marginal, you'll find that that's just a bit flipping channel with a bit flipping probability that's smaller than one, uh, smaller than one half. And hence, you find that you reduce x to u and y to v. I don't want to say more about it. It's very straightforward. I just want to kind of go through it for <laughs> once for real. Right? And like I said, the, the, the main thing uh, that's maybe closest to my heart is that one can prove that in the special case of Gaussian statistics, this CICA procedure, using whatever projection you want of the two or of the three that we have, in all cases, the CICA becomes exactly CCA for Gaussian statistics, right? So that's a kind of a sanity check that maybe this procedure is interesting, uh, has some merit, right? We, we don't know, okay? But that's, that's kind of the, the, the story that I'm trying to tell you here. So for the Gaussian case, we first need to understand how does this problem work out when X and Y are jointly Gaussian random variables? Just scalars for now, so they're uh, you know the usual nice scalars with a correlation coefficient rho, and that actually has a very nice formula. So this is the formula for the relaxed Weiner's common information, Gauss jointly Gaussians with correlation rho. Um, 
Yeah, maybe I should say this. Note that the variance of X and Y have no impact. And that's intuitively very pleasing, right? That would be kind of similar uh, to CCA, actually. The variance in the end doesn't matter because you're only after correlations. Um, the other note is that this formula corresponds uh, to the case when the auxiliary W is picked jointly Gaussian with X and Y. Um, that's very easy. Once you assume that W is jointly Gaussian with X and Y, then you know, it's a bit tedious, but you will get this formula. So the hard part of the proof is actually to understand that indeed it is an optimal solution. It's a minimizer to pick W jointly Gaussian with X and Y. How did we do this? Well, oh, I have a little picture here, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, this is what it looks like, I guess. Uh, it's a fun property about the slopes, which is very helpful in solving the um, allocation problem. But actually, I think I, I will not say too much about this and instead tell you a little bit about the proof. So the proof, the, the core argument of the proof is this old theorem by Koch and Bernstein, which perhaps you have had in your probability class. I actually haven't, I hadn't. So it, I discovered it much later. It's not actually that hard to prove, but with at least with characteristic functions, you can quickly prove it. Uh, it says the following, if you know of two random variables, x1 and x2, that they are independent, and you happen to know that x1 plus x2 and x1 minus 2 are also independent, then that is enough to infer that they are Gaussian. I should have written Gaussian because I call it Gaussian everywhere. Sorry about that. x1 and x2 are Gaussian random variables. Okay, so if you see in the if part, there is no mention of Gaussian anywhere, right? So the Gaussian really comes out of thin air, uh, which is kind of nice. Now, the art of using this uh, to your advantage is uh, not something that I will explain here. Sometimes some people like to call it a doubling trick, or you, you look at uh, you know, two copies of the optimizer and you show that x1 plus x2 is also an optimizer by often an information theoretic argument. And it's not quite everything. We need something called the factorization of convex envelope, uh, developed, I think, uh, mostly by Geng and Nair and others. And perhaps just to put a, a small plug, a similar argument has been used by Gang and Nair for the broadcast channel and also by us uh, for the M user multiple access channel with feedback. So this argument has been used for a few things. There's more examples that I could have added, has been used for a few examples. You can also use it nicely actually for, for classes. Uh, you can use it to prove max entropy uh, and, and other things. So in, in quite a nice way. Okay, so that's kind of the heart of the argument. Now, what to do with Gaussian vectors? Uh, there's not much to say here. I've said most of it in my preparation on CCA. So now let X and Y be jointly Gaussian random vectors, right? Same dimensions. Uh, of course, that's just, I've rewritten the definition of my relaxed Weiner's common information with this budget gamma, right? So how do we proceed? Well, of course, we remember that one-to-one -one transforms do not change. Uh, well, actually, I, I didn't go through this, but if you just stare at the formula, you can see that one-to-one -one transforms do not change relaxed Weiner's common information. Why is that? Because think about changing X and Y. It shows up only inside information expressions. And there, it's very easy to prove that one-to-one -one transforms will not change the value of an information expression. Uh, if you wish, by data processing inequality. So we do, we apply a one-to-one -one transform, and of course it's going to be our favorite CCA transform. So instead of doing X and Y, we do X tilde and Y tilde. And if you wish, this last sentence is the key. As you remember, of course, the, the, the pairs, right after doing this transform to X tilde and Y tilde, the pairs are, in the, are uncorrelated. But you also remember that for Gaussians, if you're uncorrelated, it means that you're independent, right? So CCA transform in the Gaussian case gives you independent pairs. And at that point, we can use our tensorization property. And we know that the Gaussian uh, you know, uh, vector case has this simple formula with, I guess, the asterisk that you still have to do the allocation problem. It doesn't have a closed form solution. I have one picture here, right? You, you have to pick if you wish. You like this parlance, a water level. So you pick a water level uh, and you can see these are the gammas here. And then this will tell you how much uh, of each, how, how you pick each of these gamma i's and then you can figure out the, uh, the, the value, if you wish, of, of, the, 
of the um, relaxed Weiner's common information. Um, I think what's, uh, yeah. Oh, and maybe I should em emphasize this. What's nice is perhaps this to realize that you can see that what is the K, which is the number of survivors in this little game here, right? What you can see is in my picture, the n minus first and the nth component, the ones with the smallest correlation in this particular configuration do not get any act, anything active. So they will be at zero. Their contribution will be zero, right? So that's the, that's the meaning here. And so K is the number of survivors or let, let's define K as the number of survivors. And you can see, um, I've done it out for you here, but it's from the picture quite clear is that if you pick a really small uh, uh, value of gamma, um, then you then everybody survives, and and if you pick uh, larger and larger, then uh, uh, you, you you will you know have only the most important, only the coarsest guys are left. Maybe I should show you the K of gamma function. And so here's the theorem. I I haven't written it as a theorem, but this is kind of the the the, the main result, right? It says that. Uh, let's first look at the left side. So for a random vector with coherence matrices, and here I'm just writing these entries, right? Kx, Ky, and then the, the, the coherence between X and Y. Uh, we saw that, you know, the, the CCA logic is find the top K CCA components, right? That's what you want to do. For example, the top one, then you just project on the most important uh, uh, right and left singular value. Um, on the right-hand side, this is what CICA does for Gaussian random vectors. It first solves the relaxed Weiner's common information problem, right? At some level gamma, and I guess we know in the Gaussian case, we know exactly how to translate a certain gamma into the K that uh, you will get. Then find the optimal auxiliary. And I guess the optimal auxiliary can be shown. I'm not, I haven't shown you exactly the full proof for this, but can, because it's jointly Gaussian, I guess it's quite beautiful, can be shown to take exactly this shape, right? It's the sum of the X part, the Y parts, and well, some additional Gaussian, Gaussian noise. And now, I guess I've written it here only for the conditional expectation. It will be the same for the max probability. Um, so now just find these conditional expectations. And if you do that diligently, you'll find that it's exactly the same thing as over here. There is, I, I left it in here. There is, if you actually do the calculation, you'll see there is this Nugent's by just a, a, a diagonal scaling matrix. Um, but that doesn't matter because the, the CCA problem is not is, is, is only defined up to scaling, right? You can always scale up and down. And I guess one common normalization of CCA is that you say the vectors have to have a, a unit norm. So this is, in a sense, this is the whole proof of, of, the, um, uh, of this main theorem. I haven't shown you the full details, but you get exactly the same answer uh, for in the Gaussian case. All right. And so I think the, the most interesting part in many ways, and I don't have full answers there, is what I'll call the multivariate case. So what if you have more than two, right? We mentioned so the, for two that the goal was to extract u of x and v of y to capture the commonality, okay? What if we have x, y, and z? And actually, let me number them because I'll directly want to go to more than just three. So from now on, the data sets will not be called x, y, z, but x1, x2, x3. And we want to extract features uh, u1 of x1 and so on, okay? Representing the commonality. Um, and that was kind of this, you know, this early teaser that I said that seems unclear how you would do that for CCA. Um, here, of course, this, this uh, rationale still works, right? You can still try to talk about what is a common, what is a good definition of a common information or a common part between more than two. And the projection operation anyway is still well-defined. Um, so, but how should you define the common information? Right. For two, it was this, okay? For two, it was just the information that the W keeps, you wanna minimize the information that the W keeps about the pair X, Y under the condition that W has to make X and Y conditional independent. And then we relax this conditional independence by a gamma, right? So how to extend this to more than two? Uh, I think it's quite obvious for the first guy, right? Because here we can just say, we want to minimize the information that the, the W keeps about everybody. 
and not just the two guys, but everybody. It's not so clear for this second part. Okay, the one that we've studied so far is one that uses what's called the total correlation. Um, so this is the definition that we want to use. Uh, relaxed wires coming information for m variables. We can define it as this minimum. And now we have this new constraint here. It's definitely consistent when you pick gamma equals to zero, it says exactly that the x's have to be conditionally independent given w. Uh, when you increase gamma, what is its meaning? Well, I should say as a footnote for those of you who have studied this, this, this uh, extension would be well motivated through the gray Weiner source coding network. So this, it would directly come, if, if you analyze that network, you would directly end up with this kind of a definition. But beyond that, you could definitely replace uh, this by you know dual total correlation, right? From Tess von Hahn's uh, definition or something else. We want to do just this for today because for this actually we have some small result. Um, so the algorithm is the same as before, right? Pick a gamma in the interesting range, that's your resolution level, solve this optimization problem leading to the, you know, the distribution. And then you can again do this you know, map version or conditional expectation. You can see there's really no change. It looks exactly the same because it was not sensitive to, to two. So what does this give you, right? We had this, uh, we had this, we mentioned this, this simple three source example in the binary case um, where I guess just to repeat quickly, U and V and X1 and Y2 and Z2 are all independent Bernoulli one half random variables, okay? So, you can see, and that's what we observed before, is that any pair of these vectors are actually pairwise independent, right? So there's not much you can gain from anything here. It seems, at least with pairwise measures. So what does, but what would you like the answer to be? Let me put it this way. What would you like the answer to be? Um, and I, I would claim one good answer, one answer that you would be happy with is to reduce X just to U, Y just to V, and z to u plus v, right? So if, if you think of kind of a three-dimensional plot, that would, I guess, somehow uh, capture, uh, you know, the dependent, the real, the, the residual dependence, or, or the, the, you know, if you wanted to visualize this data, I would show you the right thing. And, and we can actually do that. So it's not completely trivial. You can find the proof in the paper. You can prove at least for gamma equals to zero. So that's just the, um, the the classical you know, conditional independent case, we can show that the optimizing W in, in, in this uh, you know, extended problem is exactly U comma V. And then if you project this back, you can conclude that that's actually the answer you'll get. You'll get exactly that you, know, you project U, X to U, Y to V and Z to U plus V. And um, I think you know, that's maybe more just an example to show you that, you know, could be, could be a nice way of doing business. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. So we've introduced this relaxed wires kind of information and this algorithm. The main technical result is really this, right? Gaussian CICA equals CCA. Um, I should maybe, yeah, I, should, I should quickly point out this, that the same technique actually also resolves the Gaussian gray Weiner network, if this is something that you're interested in. And that's described in the paper. Um, I guess CICA can be, apply to discrete value data in, in a meaningful way. That's a bit of a claim, right? I've shown you just some examples. Um, well, natural extent to more than two. And I think the big elephant in my room, of course, is how to practically implement this. So we're working on it. We have some you know, gradient descent style implementations. I don't have any impressive data to show right now, hopefully in the near future. So that's, that's all I wanted to say, but you know, I'm happy to discuss questions or anything. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. So we can take questions uh, over chat if, uh, if people have questions. Maybe we can ask Zong Hong to prepare to ask the question. I can try to unmute him uh, because he asked the, the question about the least uh, linear square. But in the meantime, maybe I can ask a question. So. Um, so what was your motivation in, in, uh, in studying CCA in terms of applications? And do you think this new de relaxed definition could also be applied there? To what, sorry? To... So uh, usually what are the application of the original definition of, of CCA? And, and do you think the, this new 
definition with this gamma parameter could also help there like i mean in summary what kind of application you have in mind for for these for these uh, definitions oh i see, I see. well like you say right the same exact ones that cca had right cca you could say in the first place let's just call it data visualization right what would you do if you have exactly this situation so you have collected data and it comes in pairs right uh, one long vector x and one long vector y right and you get many of these pairs right you, this, i don't know some sensor network data or biological data or healthcare data or like you know society data or whatnot right so you would like to understand you know what's in this data right and i guess cca is one natural way to to kind of you know get started you you think like well, you know are these vectors uh, close to independent or like the you know is x kind of independent of y or are they quite correlated well what you would do is find exactly you know the direction for each the direction in which such that they're most correlated right to pull out the common driver between x and y if there's none right if you maximize the correlation and you find it's just a, a, a completely round blob probably there is nothing right your x and y are just independent instead maybe you get you know blobs sprinkled across or you get some high correlation value right some kind of line then you you do something else i think th these are kind of the motivations behind cca right okay. and so uh, I, it would be just the same you could just use this this cica if you know if you if you I, I guess you know at the very high level my point is of course a bit mean but it's to say that cca is not such a good fit for discrete value data right an extreme case of discrete value data is this very meanly constructed binary symmetric example where cca even completely fails it doesn't do anything right so that's kind of the the, the story is pick exactly an application where you would have done cca your CCA does, seems to say it's, there's nothing in the data. Well, try CICA. There may be something, you know, whatever, higher order, so to speak, right? There may be correlation, something that you cannot see just in correlations. It only shows up if you do a little more work. Okay. So and another quick question before we, we ask the audience. So uh, in terms of the case where you have multiple vectors, how bad or good is the idea of stacking maybe two vectors together and then just going back reverting back to the case of two vectors yeah yeah exactly and that is a technique that people have tried of course that's exactly true so so it if will you look good. on your favorite resource you know wikipedia or something i bet you that's what they'll tell you there that you try it in all possible ways you just optimize you know one guy given everything else in this linear uh, a linear perspective you can do that right okay so 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 uh, so among the audience emra has a question so, uh, Emra, I think uh, Christy will unmute you, and you can uh, you can ask the question. So let's hope this would work. Can Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear. Yeah, okay, you. okay. Uh, so first, I want to thank you. It was a great, uh, really nice uh, talk. And uh, what I wanted to ask is, uh, why do we need the relaxed variation of common information? Because tensorization works also for the classical, you know. I can specialize gamma to zero and I get the classical common information and all this nice, uh, you know, CCI analysis would work for the classical common information as well. So I was wondering, uh, is there a specific reason where, for example, is there a problem where we, we have to optimize over gamma so that the gamma wouldn't correspond to zero? Uh, I was just wondering about that. Thank you very much for this question. I think this is, I'll try to modify that. So the, the thing, if you just leave gamma at zero, right, then yeah. in the Gaussian case, for example, you can immediately see what happens. If you fix gamma to be zero, to zero, then it's just a one-to-one -one transform, right? So you're not actually extracting anything, right? You're just transforming. So if you want to have this, you know, dimensionality reduction business, you need to say how, by how much you reduce, right? So, of course, in the Gaussian case, you're going to tell me always, well, it's always kind of, you know, dimensions, so, so we can just, but think about for, you know, any, an arbitrary, you know, discrete case or just any data, right? It, you, you, it would not be clear how you would reduce, right? If there's no way, if, if you leave gamma at zero, that's always the most extreme case. You keep everything, right? You keep 
in CCA parlance, gamma equals to zero is the same as picking K to be N, right? Meaning I pick, I, re I dimension reduce the original vectors of length N to new vectors of length N, right? And you can see that's kind of not very interesting because it's still the same number of vectors, right? Now in CCA, of course, it's, it's kind of easy. Once you have these N new vectors, you're just gonna keep the first one. But you can imagine that if you have discrete value data, it's not clear what you would do next, right? There is no such nice ordering. It's not that it's just a matrix, right? It's some arbitrary remapping. It's not clear how you would do it. So in a sense, this gamma is key. It's super important. You definitely don't want to pick it in general. You don't want to pick it zero. The doctored examples, and that, that's maybe the mistake of my doctored examples. The doctored examples always had gamma equals to zero because I set it up such that other than the gamma equals to zero, right? Other than the common part, everything else was independent. But from the Gaussian case, you can see that if you wanted to use this in practice, you really want gamma and you don't want to pick it just zero. In general, you want to pick, you want to play with gamma because some gamma will give you exactly the right level of um, resolution, right? The right coarseness, the right number of dimensions. It's a good point. I like it. I, I should think of a more com a good example that really drives home this point. But if you think about it a little bit, without the gamma, it actually makes you don't have an algorithm, right? Without the gamma, it's just yeah, you can find this you know, common information, but that's it, right? Then you can you, you cannot pick the number of dimensions. Does this make sense a little bit, or well, a bit confusing? So, so. Yeah, <laughs> I'll work on it. Uh, um, yes, yes. Of uh, it makes sense uh, in the in the you know multi-dimensional case where you need the CCA obviously uh, you would need gamma or something like that some something that would eliminate the you know uh, less important components. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, Michael, we have one more question from Zhang Hong. So if uh, Zhang Hong could be unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for my previous type of. Uh, I meant to ask about uh, partial least square. And I just saw the answer from some book. It seems that partial least square is just a CA y is one dimension. And I have another question. You have showed an example in part two of your presentation, uh, which is x and y. They are both three dimensional random variables, uh, say u, x, uh, v, and x, y. Uh, I think the gamma here is just the mutual information between Vx and the Vy, right? Very good. That's a very nice observation. I can, I, I did not take the time to explain this figure because I don't know, I just felt going through that the value was not big enough, but I'm happy to pull it up again. And you can see it here, right? You can see I put these labels in with the mutual informations and so on. I, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so if you wish, for example, this gamma, the most extreme value, this is the same as the mutual information between X and Y, right? Because uh, the, the X3 and Y3 are independent. So, so that's all that's left. That's exactly the mutual information, as you say. And then I guess there's another interesting intercept when gamma is exactly equal to the mutual information between VX and VY. At that point, you start kind of bringing in the commonality between VX, right? If gamma is in this window, then it's only you, it's only gonna be you. And then after here, you're gonna to start to bring in Vx and Vy. I don't, I don't know if that's related to what, yeah, what you're yeah. pointing out. And in application, how do we choose gamma? Ah, very good. And and there is really not, not a good answer to this, right? It's, it, I don't know, right? I know it for the Gaussian case, I can show you exactly how you pick it, but more generally, I don't know, right? It's, it's something that I think that's that's totally missing. I, I, I mean, we have this upper bound, don't pick it larger than the mutual information because after that, it's just nothing, right? You retain W is the is the, the all zeros random variable. <clears throat> but below it, it's a good point. And I don't know, I don't have a good answer to this. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Hong Kong. So next, uh, Anand has a question. So Anand, you can go ahead and ask Michael. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, I, I had a question, sort of about uh, maybe it's it's predictable. What if so? If if you have some uncertainty about the distributions um, of x and y, so I, I can see that, like for example, if there's some parameter uncertainty in the Gaussian case, then 
your W sort of varies smoothly with the uncertainty that you have in like, you know, perturbations in, in say the mean invariance of the uh, X and Y, or I guess maybe the mean or there, even, even sorry, uh, per perturbations of the distribution, but do you have like a general result? Do you have like sort of a general sense that the W varies smoothly in some sense with uh, smooth changes in, in the distributions of X and Y? I, I, it's very, very interesting. I, I'm teaching this advanced uh, information theory class, just whatever, randomly. And, and I'm, I came across exactly this, this question, asking myself to what extent could one prove this, right? Um, because you can kind of construct in mean ways, exactly, right? Because it, it just go back to gamma equal to zero case, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's conditional independence. That's a kind of a brittle set, right? It's definitely not a convex set because a convex combination of, of conditional independence will not be conditional independent right. necessarily. So, so you can quickly end up outside of that set um, by small modifications. That's what I'm trying to say. So I don't, I don't know right now. I don't know. I was with the to, gamma, you're saying with, well, I guess the question is with gamma non-zero, uh, is, is, are you getting also some smoothness or like, you know. In the W, right? That's what they're asking the about the optimizing. Because as a function of gamma, that one can show, right? And I think I had it here on somewhere, right? You can show that this property number three, you can prove that C gamma is a convex and continuous function of gamma. So of gamma, it's okay. Right, but not however, of the distributions of X and however, Y necessarily. Exactly, exactly. The, the distribution, exactly, exactly. Very good, very good. So, so, so if you if you change X and Y, um, I think the W could change quite a bit. So, I wonder if you could do like a um, um, perturbation analysis where you, in the continuous case, where you you know add a little Gaussian noise to X and add a little Gaussian noise to Y, but with very small sigma, and then see what happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. One would have to do uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, yeah, it gets me. I, I think you know, one of the uglinesses of the of Weierstrom information is that the, there's only a very, very, very tiny set of cases for which the answer is known, right? So you're quickly kind of just you know outside of anything, and you, you all you you can do some, of course, some epsilon delta style analysis. I tried a little, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I think it, something can be said, but um, I don't know how much. It's a good question. All right, so if there is any more questions, so we can take one more question. Uh, otherwise, if no one posts anything on the chat, so we can conclude the talk. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, this is really nice. We really enjoyed the talk, so, and thank you again. Well, thanks for the invitation. Um, it was my pleasure. Back to the birthday party of my six-year-old. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Sorry. About that. <laughs> well, that Sorry was all planned later on. You know, that's a, the thing of home office. EPFL is closed. I'm not allowed to go. So. <laughs> all great, right. great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best.